Uh, well, everyone, good afternoon. Uh, everyone will attend this live and on Zoom. Uh, today's first lecture will be by Professor Sapana Pistova. She's an urban sociologist, researcher, lecturer, and associate professor at the Faculty of Arts of the Southwest University of in Blagojevgrad, Bulgaria. Uh, she headed and coordinated a number of projects in the field of sociology and culture, cultural anthropology, and urban studies. She also has experience as a speaker, moderator, and co-organizer of various discussions, seminars, and conferences, and is also a vice chair on the section of urban sociology at the Bulgarian Sociological Association. Her main research interests are sociology of culture and cultural anthropology. Uh, without further ado, I would give the words and presentation to our first lecturer, Sadat Pistol. Uh, professor, excuse me, uh, your microphone is turned off. We can't hear you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to your very interesting symposium. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I have been cooperating with um, Sociology. Excuse me, but we still can't hear you. I think it's a technical malfunction on our side, maybe perhaps the speakers. We're looking to it now. Um, do, you, do you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me now? Or uh, I hear you, but I, I'm not sure why, why you. We have some uh, communication. Sure, excuse me, but uh, if you could just wait for a few more minutes until we uh, resolve the situation. Shall I? Maybe I, I will switch off and then switch on again. Uh, hello, can we, can we hear each other? I, I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, now we can hear. Now we can hear. Okay, okay. So, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to your meeting. Um, I would like to, um, in a way, to connect my presentation with um, with my experience of cooperation with Croatian colleagues, sociologists, and also people believing in interculturalism. Vinko Zidaric was one of them. And here is another, I don't know, do you, do you see my, do you see uh, the video? Um, I try to show you a book that has been prepared by Milan Mesic, uh, a former professor at Zagreb University in sociology, Milan Mesic, uh, a book devoted to perspectives of multiculturalism, Western and transitional countries. By that time, uh, more than 10 years ago, we all were transitional countries. Now, uh, Bulgaria and Croatia are both members of European Union and uh, but whether the intercultural values have been advanced and enhanced in the meantime. So um, let me let me start with my presentation which is which is um, devoted to Vinko Zidaric and Milan Mesic. Mm, I have also sent you the PowerPoint living on the volcano of civilization, but I will share it from my computer, but you have it as well. I will try to share it now.
um, do you do you see the presentation? Uh, yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have um, we have observed during the last two years and something a very um, weird situation that have um, that have uh, that needed to be addressed by sociologists and in a way um, that was a situation which was affecting the existing until recently globalization patterns um, in this presentation i will try to uh, share my my uh, ideas about um, and my interpretation of the recent COVID-19 as a dress rehearsal, as a global dress rehearsal to risk society. While for sociologists, risk society is a well-known concept, it seems that it is forgotten for a lot of other people working in social, social sciences and hu human sciences. So the questions I will try to, to raise and to address here is um, how much the COVID-19 as a global humanitarian crisis is really responding to what we can discern, observe as risk society. Is it risk society really? Um, is it the end of liquid modernity? Because one of the many uh, nicknames of modernity was liquid modernity. Uh, whether what we observe now is de-globalization or just a new kind, a new pattern of globalization is being observed less, with less mobility, but more connectivity. Whether the rebordering that we have observed during the last few years really means disappearing of global society or rather emerging of different kind of transborder imagined communities, imagined communities that go beyond nation states. It was uh, a lot, there was a lot of talking about the new normal. So what is this new normal and how, um, how steady and how um, st st uh, stable is this new normal? I think that partially we can respond even when we are addressing the recent humanitarian crisis started with the war in Ukraine. We immediately forgot about wearing masks, about pandemic concerns. We forgot all this that kept us alert during the last two years. And what is this post-COVID world that is emerging? I think there are some general trends that can be described as medicalization of life, new awareness about nature, including new animism, as um, an argument has been put by Mike Featherstone, resetting the direction of urbanization. Are we going to see the end of huge global cities, or this is just something that is uh, um, a moment in the development of urbanization, the resetting of the direction of urba uh, urbanization to smaller and medium-sized cities. Is it um, a moment or uh, a, a trend? Also, there were a lot of debates about how to support people who cannot work from their offices, how to support those who cannot exercise their professions. And um, 
there was interesting debate in the European Union. Um, maybe um, leading us to the conclusion that what we observe here is the, the end of the future of capitalism, that we are approaching some sort of new social order, but what kind of order is it? Also, um, a brief note will be about, mentioned about the new leaderships that emerge now from this uh, emergency situation. So, uh, just to remind some of the most important uh, features of world society, world risk society, in the well-known um, book that has been uh, published a few times and written and um, additionally reworked by Ulrich Beck, The Risk Society Towards New Modernity, initially published in, uh, in German in 1987, then in English in 1992. I mentioned this fact because actually there, there have been several signal texts that have been published immediately after the Chernobyl catastrophe. The other important text, although not scientific analysis, but a political document was called Our Common Future. The, the report produced by Brutland Commission in 1987, almost in the same uh, year when the Risk Society by Beck was published. So, um, I find that there is uh, a really a lot of similarities, although expressed differently between these two texts. And I find them as signal texts, signal for emerging of, of some new situation in the world. So to, to, to remind the, the, briefly the concept of Beck, um, he considers the risk uh, as byproducts of late modernization. There have always been risks in the development of human civilization, but um, during um, the late modernization, the risks have been produced. Uh, they have been side product of industrialization itself. They are globally, uh, universal, unpredictable, and inescapable. Sooner or later, they also strike those who produce or profit from them because they occur around systematic causes which coincide with the motor of progress and profit. So, mm, uh, you know, there have been a lot of criticism towards the concept of Ulrich Beck about his risk society. Um, Ulrich Beck um, explained in his book that, book that risks are universal and Ulrich Beck also underlines that unless um, the, the, the class, the class conditions, the risks are democratic. They, uh, they really universalize the living condition for all um, in, in a certain moment. Of course, uh, it is easy to, to, to um, respond that uh, when we observe current situation, the people who are better off, they uh, more easily survive through this pandemic. But let us think um, in, in a more um, long-term um, way. Let us try to, to think in a progress uh, when there is 
a risk which is usually invisible, the risk of the 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 risks of late modernization, they move through borders like nu nuclear um, uh, nuclear threat. They move through borders. They are invisible. They have to be calculated. But finally, if we imagine that the whole world is affected by this risk, there will be no island of security that will remain, even for those who have profited from this, from the production of this risk for, for a long period of time, maybe for generations. So um, in the long term, risks are universalizing the conditions and they're creating um, the equal, equally bad situation for all. This immediately affects the ethic of people living in risk society. Um, and we noticed during the pandemics that we know that there have been different features of such kind of new type of solidarity. Um, as Antonio Guterres in April 2020 said, our world faces a common enemy, COVID-19. The virus does not care about nationality or ethnicity, faction or faith. It attacks all relentlessly. And this is really the, um, uh, the good starting point for observations this universalizing effect of the COVID-19, which, as I said, is our dress rehearsal worldwide, spreading everywhere the same conditions and the same threat. This evokes new solidarity consciousness, exactly prescribed by Ulrich Beck, moving from solidarity of needs, typical for class societies, to solidarity motivated by anxiety, typical for risk societies. Uh, within the horizon of risk, the binary coding that has been um, a, a good um, a pattern for survival for many centuries this being recording is not valid anymore. What is permitted or what is forbidden? What is legal and what is illegal in the face of mass disaster, of massive deaths? It is less important anymore, even right or wrong is not uh, the, the, the idea of right and wrong is not valid anymore. Us and them, we all are foreigners and we all are us at the same moment. Foreigners because we are entering into a situation that we cannot recognize. We do not recognize the landscape. This is the landscape of uncertainty that that is that we cannot recognize and we cannot orient ourselves within this new landscape. Um, as correctly uh, described by Ulrich Beck, there is a great preoccupation with future. Risk society is really turned towards future and cannot stop thinking about future. Um, for, for, for this um, slide I chose, a building that has been uh, raised in Brussels, one of the eight World Trade Center buildings raised in Brussels with a huge uh, label, the future is here. As a matter of fact, this building has been ruined. And um, we can take it as a grand metaphor of the development of our civilization. In a, in a book published in 2006, 
that is called The Brief History of Future, Jacques Attali um, speaks about future development, future collapse of the capitalist civilization with the emergence of huge masses of immigrants, people seeking for safer life, attacking our home, Europe. And it is uh, interesting that, um, at least in my knowledge, for a first time, as far as I know, a scientific book has been used as a, as a token for exhibition, exhibition presented in, at the same time in Paris, France, and in uh, Bozar, uh, Brussels in 2015, a brief history of the a future. This is one of the pictures presenting still lightened oil gas station. It is still lightened, but there is no, there are no people around. There is no sign of human life. There is no, no gas and no oil anymore. All around is a jungle. And um, notably, almost in the same time when the exhibition in Bazaar and in Paris was uh, open. There were terrorist attacks as if to demonstrate that really there is no security anymore in the world. Mm. What we observed at the beginning of the advent of COVID-19 was uh, with all signs of slowing down and locking of any mobility that raised another troublesome question. Do we observe the end of liquid modernity? Liquid modernity is a notion introduced by Zygmunt Bauman. But uh, as a matter of fact, these were Kevin Hannam, Mimi Scheller and John Uri, who contributed a lot to spread the idea that we live in a civilization that could be determined as mobile civilization. In uh, uh, 20 years ago, they started a new scientific journal called Mobilities. And um, they intended to, um, to analyze and to disseminate um, all various facts about the different aspects of the mobility um, affect our civilization. The ways mobilities are um, changing our world. And it was really a moment when we couldn't imagine that we shall see in 2020, 21, 22, entirely empty uh, airports. But it happened because as Kenny, Kevin Hannam, uh, Scheller and Uri noted, mobilities are changing our life, our institutions, but they are also centrally involved in moving risks and illnesses across the globe, altering travel, tourism and migration patterns. So um, it seemed that the same situation prolonged in the mid of 2020 and even today when uh, we have for forgotten a lot about the restrictions, the mobility restrictions, it is still valid that we travel only in, in uh, only rarely we prefer 
short destinations. We, uh, we go abroad only when necessary, not for pleasure. All that promised pleasure before and the whole um, human economy was in a way centered around, around pleasure and experience. It was called experience economy. All that is not so valid anymore. The safety is the new keyword. The safety and avoiding the risk. So what we observe now is the slowly emergence of some sort of new normal. New normal in which people are more careful about their own health. New normal in which people um, are ready to give up part of their freedoms for their sake, for the sake of their safety. And um, I think that um, the, the notion of safe, safety um, authoritarianism is really working. Uh, the notion uh, is good, although created by Agamben um, more than 10 years ago, it is quite valid nowadays. And thank you for this. Um, for these reflections of our Italian colleagues. So we, we have um, a, still a huge problem and the governments are still solving the most difficult equation with two unknowns, to restore the health of nations while maintaining the health of economies. And there is interplay between these two unknowns each state is trying to make its own um, formula to discover its own way. And it seems that um, sometimes we, we, we preserve to the old new normal. Sometimes we are moving to new old normal, uh, depending on the gov government and depending on the political situation. But certainly there is an, um, a political play as well. Um, our hopes and challenges in the post-COVID world, that was a picture taken from Charles Bridge in Prague last year. Um, th there was um, a, a really, uh, a very spectacular celebration of the end of the pandemic, but then the pandemic returned and the, uh, the new restrictions were imposed again. So in a way, um, the world that is to come will not appear at once. And uh, the, the world that is appearing cannot be uh, easily described. Um, in Wuhan 2021, they said that they returned to life as usual. Uh, but uh, and that was the celebration of uh, in a in a um, cultural center called Happy Valley of Wuhan. You see, people are uh, were really eager. Young people, especially, were really eager to celebrate the end of the pandemic. But when we see uh, the the photos from the streets of Wuhan we recognize the old picture, almost no movement, people wearing masks and um, the, according to the economic um, performance, the economies are working at health capacity. The life as usual is at health capacity only by now. And also another mm, strange, um, aspect of our life appeared, which we can describe as medicalization of human life. Uh, really, our human life is more and more devoted in ser to search uh, of security. This is um, a, 
flame worked borosilicate glass by Lang, by uh, called Langs by Kit Tolson. The photos is permitted, shared with, with permission. Uh, people are interested in the functioning of their bodies. People are aware of the importance of every part of their bodies. So on the one hand, we see um, a raised public awareness about uh, um, physical um, borders of, of our bodies and functioning of our uh, and our functioning as physical bodies. And of course, there is preoccupation with this. On the other side, as correctly, as very well described um, by the Italian colleague, uh, I'm sorry to not to remember his name, um, some sort of techno-medical domination began to appear. Um, only partially it is based on the quantification of all aspects of our physical existence. Really, we all now have different gadgets to, to measure different aspects of the functioning of our physical organisms, our pulse, our breath, our the capacity of our lungs, things that we were not interested at all only a few years ago. But this gives a foot to new unions between political power and medical expertise. This can be in the worst um, scenario um, beginning of the new um, political order based on hypermedicalization. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, an old an old photo from October twenty twenty one uh, from uh, the opening of Moscow Hospital after the name of Davidov. Presenting the new relationship between human and animal and mercy mercy that should be universal feature of our action. Uh, stained glass work by Maxim Cantor, I decided not to put it away because I think that we should make a distinction between the action of political um, elite or political autocracy in a country and the artistic people who, who do not share the same values. So uh, we also observed during the last few years resetting the direction of urbanization. In a recent debate between Joel Kotkin and Richard Florida, a lot of data has been presented to the so-called Moon debates um, that took place last year. Uh, a lot of data has been presented that actually people are people in America, but I think similar trends can be observed in Europe too. People are moving, whether permanently or for, or for, for, um, for the period of um, COVID. Uh, people are moving uh, and leaving the big cities because 95% of the infected by COVID-19 live in cities. Um, and in a way, this coincides with the trend that has been already once um, predicted and uh, prescribed by the um, report of the uh, called Our Common Future, that uh, we need to create different kinds of urbanization models taking the pressure of the largest urban centers and building up smaller towns and cities, more closely integrating them with their rural hinterlands. In a way, um, the pandemic is 
pushing us into a healthy direction, I would say, if we manage to, to understand better the, the pluses and the minuses of our present world. Um, the, the same report, our common future, also um, prescribed that priorities should be set for sustainable and safe urban future, unleashing participatory power of people and preserving the public spaces as safe spaces of creativity and bridging local communities and municipalities and relevant city offices. So mm, if we take this direction, perhaps uh, we increase our ch chances, chances as nation states, as regions, as Europeans, and as global citizens to survive through this stage of our development and to reach a more civilized human and uh, socially just society. Uh, just to mention a uh, few more observations, um, this is Mission Dolores Park of San Francisco, May 2021. I don't know whether you can see well this photograph, but actually this is a stadium and people uh, are um, visiting this public space occupying different circles. Everyone, usually these are couples, everyone sitting in its own circle. This is, is it um, a real public space? I believe that Habermas would say it is not a public space, but still um, this is the last reserve of physical conviviality. Uh, it should be preserved, it should be kept, and maybe in a moment it, it will um, grow into authentic, true public space. I think that in Europe we already observe this, uh, although we observe it with the emergence of new risk situation, the humanitarian Ukrainian crisis. Another, another important debate that has been raised during the last three years, that was the, EU, the European Union discussion about minimum income systems as an urgent safety net after COVID-19. And I would say this discussion in a way, it does not uh, question the logic of the capitalist development. It, it doesn't question the welfare system. It questions the logic of capitalist development. And the strategic dilemma is therefore not just to establish new balance between rich and poor countries, big and small cities and regions, but the big question is how to establish um, a balance or how to change the model from profit-driven to safety-driven way of thinking and acting, from profit-driven economies to safety-driven models with regard and with respect to human needs. So um, also uh, these were the, the American scientists as Joel Kotkin who uh, sign out about the, some changes in, um, in the uh, way um, human labor has been um, awarded and uh, has been treated. Besides the job losses and the higher unemployment rate, uh, for the first time, 
in America, there have been not noticed and measured um, rising of wages for lower income laborers. A new, it seems a new divide between digital employment and labor, physical labor is emerging and physical labor, let us not take it um, just as um, rich, poor divide and physical labor as necessarily lower income, um, less um, professionalized labor. Um, physical is also the labor of the su surgeons. Physical is the labor of the medical workers so needed in this situation. So this new divide um, between digital labor and physical lab labor can also be interpreted on the basis of safety. The, the digital labor in all cases is safer labor in comparison with all other sorts of labor that are physical. And for this reason, they are more wanted, more necessary and uh, more estimated. And finally, I just want to, um, to um, underline the emergence of new kind of leadership. And this kind of leadership, um, I uh, take, um, uh, I, I start from uh, the very um, widely spread definition of sustainability that has been taken um, and uh, repeated and echoed sometimes uncritically from our future, our common future report, that sustainability is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I myself think this is already a very blank and um, already emptied definition. It needs to be reassessed and recontextualized. But uh, I want also to point out that the future generations are already here that future is already here and that, that future generations have already grown up and now they speak for themselves. They don't need advocates and they don't need their parents to talk on behalf of them. Um, the future generations that dare to ask the American president, how dare you? Um, that was also, to great extent in, um, uh, in synchrony with uh, the recommendations of our common future report. So you can recognize, of course, the, the voice, the face and the voice of one of these remarkable representatives of the so-called future generation who said, we want people to step up, to dare to step up of their comfort zone, to prioritize the future instead of now. The bigger your platform, the bigger your moral duty. Everyone can be a leader, said Greta Thunberg in, meeting, in a meeting with Angela Merkel in 2020. Everyone can be a leader. And this is really another very promising idea that we can found both in the book of Ulrich Beck, The Risk Society and Our Common Future. Either there will be a future for all of us or there, there will be no future at all. So thank you. I tried to, to use COVID-19 as a playground uh, and to show that on this playground, our societies are trying to reestablish their cultural new boundaries 
but this is the process. This is a um, two-directional process uh, of returning and advancing again. But obviously, the direction is to universalizing the risks and thinking about global future of all of us. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry for being not quite coherent with my presentation, but I am open for your questions, comments. May I do a question? Yes, of course. Uh, yes. I just want to switch off my presentation in order to be able to, um, to, to see you and to, to talk with you. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, uh, Stefano? Yes. 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 No. You may. You may. Uh, if anyone has any other questions on Zoom, please uh, to use the chat function uh, so that I can uh, follow the the line of our argumentation easier. And oh. for live, just raise your hands and I will. Um. Okay. I'll finish. Finally, finally. I... May I do the question? Yes, uh, just a short question. I want to thank uh, colleagues Svetlana for having quoted uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, which is a very, very famous author, both in sociology, in philosophy, and in, and in law in Italy. Uh, and especially Agamben used the term biopolitics uh, to express uh, the attention of uh, political activity around the physical body and the naked life at the center of political debate. And do you think, Svetlana, that this attention to um, naked life uh, after COVID will remain uh, permanently as an asset of political activity also in the future? Or will be something only linked to uh, this emergency? I, I, I believe that it will remain. Uh, you, you are Stefano that actually you presented or you are going to present uh, about uh, Agamben and uh, thank you. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you, um, uh, you attracted my attention to, um, to these very fruitful Agamben um, ideas, uh, which are absolutely applicable to the present situation. And uh, in a way, it enriches the whole description of what is risk society. Part of this risk society is this hyper attention to um, biopolitics. Uh, this could be one of the scenario and maybe one of the worst scenarios. Uh, still, mm, we are a society of uh, great consciousness and self-awareness and um, whether this scenario will be um, applied uh, permanently, it will depend to, to some extent uh, to the, to, to the re reactions of civil society. We, we see that in some uh, countries we have strong civil societies and we are trying to um, overthrow this hyper medicalization that is not productive but that keeps people to their quite low profile of biological entities and nothing more in fact thank you very much Svetlana. thank you very much i thank you for your presentation which is really very fruitful oh thank you very much really any other questions? Yes. Then, uh, first you, then. Uh, you have stated the uh, difference between the concept of solidarity of needs and solidarity of uh, 
Can you a little bit lower, please? I, I don't hear you well. Okay, okay. Um, I will talk a bit louder. Uh, you have stated uh, two concepts. Solidarity of needs and the sort of solidarity that is built on a common feeling of anxiety uh, regarding, uh, regarding the risks we are facing. Um, what I uh, wanted to ask you, whether you, uh, whether you feel that uh, this sort of solidarity is developing despite uh, recent events with uh, where uh, global peace was uh, shattered. As a matter of fact, we li what we observe now in relation to Ukrainian humanitarian crisis, we see an unprecedented rise of global solidarity. We haven't seen this before. Even in 2015, when there was also a very heavy humanitarian crisis and more than 2 million refugees and economic migrants have uh, found shelters, different kind of shelters in European continent. There was no such um, manifestation of solidarity. And now solidarity uh, on both um, political level, nation state, states level and individual level and non-governmental level. Um, maybe because for the first time, what we see here is the very um, close to our mind situation that uh, allows us to accept and to, uh, to, 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 to see the refugees from Ukraine as being ourselves, as one of our alternative futures it can happen to us. And so we, we see this massive race of solidarity. There is also reconceptualization of what is stranger. Stranger, I would say that at the beginning of 20th century with the um, Zimo concept of stranger, stranger was part a legitimate part in the group, not of the group, but in the group. Now, uh, strangers are part of ourselves. And this is really a huge evolution. I would not say that it is um, necessarily a positive one evolution because it actually uh, is an evidence how fragile our situation is when everyone can turn into a stranger. So uh, yes, the solidarity, uh, but uh, about Ulrich Beck's concept of solidarity, the solidarity is being raised according to, to Ulrich Beck, not because we have the same need, but because we try to escape the same common bet. Solidarity, not of common good, but of common bad, based on escaping the common bad. And for this reason, he calls this solidarity negative solidarity. Uh, negative, not in a sense that it produces and has negative effects, but because it has been evoked by the consciousness of common bad that threats all of us. Is it? Is it what you ask me? Yes, yes. Uh, you have to <coughs> yeah, uh, I was wondering if you had I was wondering uh, if uh, if uh, this uh, situation with COVID is really something uh, so new, extraordinary, and uh, unexpected, or is it just uh, a more uh, clear, uh, a more uh, a pronounced, uh, maybe extreme version of something that uh, that is uh, a general uh, zeitgeist or something that has been uh, brewing, uh, uh, brewing up for decades, uh, like. Uh, uh, 
I think uh, a lot of the discourse and the way that uh, uh, disease is perceived with uh, COVID, uh, can, can, there can be parallels drawn uh, to uh, how uh, war was uh, banalized with uh, the Gulf War and onwards. Uh, some restrictions on travel, for instance, uh, we could draw parallels with how uh, terrorism and 9-11 uh, uh, restricted uh, uh, travel in a, in a sense. Uh, uh, the sense of a community and uh, new leadership, uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, we don't need uh, COVID or climate change for that. Uh, we could see it just as a result of new media, which is today so social media building uh, a, as McMoran would say, a global village. So is uh, COVID really something uh, uh, unexpected and uh, new, or is it just uh, an extreme example, uh, a, a recent example of something uh, more general? Oh, good question. I have asked myself, could we predict it? Um, was it possible to predict it? And in my mind, um, the, the, the risks that occur they are, they are always beyond our imagination. Uh, in a way, we have been um, expecting economic, um, economic uh, crisis. We have been expecting uh, another um, humanitarian crisis, but nobody could expect exactly um, this kind of crisis that, that will be um, initiated by the uh, explosion of a global pandemic. That was beyond our imagination. And I say that really um, the, the real life is always richer than an, our imagination um, in my mind, in my mind. But what happened, for example, with the other, um, with and the recent, humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. I am afraid it could be predicted, but we didn't. We, we didn't want to believe that it is possible. But it was, if, if you follow um, the um, strict logic of uh, the development of autocratic and totalitarian regimes, it was very close to our mind that it will happen, but we didn't believe that it will happen. So in a way, um, let, us, uh, let us just uh, resume that um, the risks are always unexpected, more or less. Uh, we are always not prepared for the, for the risks that occur that always take us by surprise. But nevertheless, we can be at least prepared that we have entered into this stage of global uncertainty. As a matter of fact, that has been described at the beginning of the 21st century by uh, some American scientists that that are dealing with globalization, they they said um, that the world has been already stifled by the breath of uncertainty. Uh, but whenever we see bad prognosis, we want to believe that they are just prognosis and that they will not come true. Unfortunately. Uh, until now, all bad prognoses came true. All sociological prognoses of good sociologists came true. So uh, let us um, take it as, as a lesson, as a moral that we need to read, to be good readers of sociology, of good sociology, <laughs> that it works, that the predictions um, are really uh, working and valid. Uh, thank you, we have uh, one other question. 
Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how do you would you agree with the statement that um, the crisis in Ukraine is perhaps more easily um, to form global solidarity around than perhaps is climate change? Because there are predictions since 50 years now which will what will happen in terms of global climate change, but I don't see that there is this feeling of common solidarity across uh, the global stage, as you said. Um, even though we are definitely seeing exactly what is happening and what was predicted since I don't know how many tens of years at least, you know, um, that it is possibly much more easier to say, hey, there we have a bad guy and everybody is against the bad guy. But there is this slow catastrophe, which is harder to formulate the solidarity around to really take collective action. Um, yeah, I think there is a difference there. You know? I um, I couldn't uh, hear you uh, quite well, but uh, uh, as far as I can understand, you are talking about why there is no solidarity when the the things about climate change and generally the ecological catastrophe uh, is uh, has so aggravated why there is no a real political solidarity. If this is your question, um, of course, this is very discouraging that uh, the things are not moving so uh, quickly. There is a danger that when the when solidarity has been raised, the necessary level of, of political solidarity among big states and among um, the the main actors in the political world stage, when this solidarity will be achieved, it will be already too late. But um, it seems that um, the consciousness necessary to raise this kind of solidarity is not developing uh, so easily. Uh, there is nothing good in the goodwill and in the good wishes, Christmas wishes, let us try to be good because actually this doesn't work. It seems there should be some um, global normative uh, framework um, inserted and functioning in order to make possible uh, the restriction of those uh, industrial damages um, to our nature that really uh, leave the future generations without future. Uh, but this really, mm, you know, uh, the, uh, the profit-minded uh, people have been lived for generations and they have been successful for at least five centuries. How do we expect that they will give up this profit-minded orientation just for 20 years. In a way, if we are realist, we don't have a lot of chances, but we have to work. And we have to enlighten as more people as possible. Uh, thank you, thank you for your answer. Uh, <coughs> that would be all for our discussion because we have, a, uh, we have to keep to our schedule. I would like once again to thank you, Professor Christopher, for an interesting lecture. Uh, hope to future, uh, hope for some future uh, collaborations as well. So once again, uh, thank you, thank you. I hope we shall uh, go on the dialogue. This is the book I mentioned, the book called Perspectives of Multiculturalism, Western and Traditional Countries by Mi Milan Message. You can see his name and um, maybe you know him pers in person. 
but uh, there is a lot of possibilities for cooperation and thank you once again for this very friendly discussion. Wishing you uh, really success with all your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Thank you very thank much, you. really. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, to everyone uh, <laughs> attendance, we will resume with the symposium in about three minutes. Thank you.